Hey, 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 what's going on? Welcome to another episode of Angular Air. I'm your host, Justin Schwarzenberger, and today we are going to be talking machine labs and checking out some stuff with machine learning. Should be pretty interesting, as always. Uh, let's get right to it. Our panelists today, we've got Alyssa joining us. Alyssa, how's it going? Hey, going good. All right, we got Austin with us as well. Austin, what's up? How's it going, everyone? And we've got Bonnie with us. Bonnie, how's it going? It's going great. I'm trying to stay dry in Houston. Awesome, awesome. And uh, Mike's going to be joining us here in a minute. So, oh, hey, he just popped on. Look at that. Good timing. Hey, Mike, what's going on? He's on mute, but he'll, there yeah, we go. I, I hear something else. Uh, I'm here. Hey. Awesome. And our guest today, we got Pascal and Christoph with us. Pascal, how's it going? Hello. What's up? And Christoph? Hey, it's good. <laughs> All right. Uh, Machine Labs, that's the project that you guys have going on. Let's dive into that. Um, I don't know. Maybe we should, well, first tell us about what Machine Labs is, and then maybe we can start diving into like what what machine learning is all about. Uh, you you want to do it that way or the other way around? Um, we we could do it either way. Uh, okay, maybe 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 let's yeah let's let let's just start with what machine learning is from like a from a bird's perspective. Um, and first things first, we are by far no experts on machine learning. So let's just get this straight out of the way. So we, we were also just like web developers interested in it, and we stumbled over problems, so we tried to address them. So take everything that you say as basically machine learning law, right? Like, it's gold. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But so just like... Um, in, <laughs> so but just in, in, in essence, so... Um, so basically, today when we when we write software, um, we 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 are basically writing code to solve problems, right? So no matter if it's like functional reactive programming or aspect oriented programming, imperative programming, at the end of the day, we are always writing code to solve problems, right? So with machine learning, um, it's it's like a total mind shift because um, you Does are. Does the machine write the code for you? <laughs> Kind of, kind of, yes, yes, kind of. So basically, you are designing a neural net, which is, um, in, in a way, tries to mimic the way our brain works. And we are throwing lots of data at the neural net and telling it, um, giving it, giving it feedback about the data. Like, you, do you want to, do you want to um, uh, make a, a neural net that can recognize cats on pictures, for instance, because everyone likes cats? So you give it a lot of a lot of data and tell it, yeah, on this picture there's a cat, and on this picture there's no cat, and on this picture there's a cat, and on this there's no cat, and um, and it will it will figure out the 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 function basically. The, it will figure out um, a way to recognize the the, the pictures, and obviously um, not only the the pictures from the cats that it already has seen, but we wanted to. We wanted to generalize, right? So we wanted to to give it any cat picture, and it it should be able to to detect the um, the, the picture on the cat and tell, yeah, there's a there's a cat on this picture or there's not. But basically, the neural net is figuring out what it takes to recognize a cat. And if we think about this, um, so with regular typical programming, um, you have to come up with a code that that can recognize shapes and everything, and then we are asking us, so what does a cat shape actually look like? I mean, the cat shape totally changes when the cat is um, like standing or when it is laying, or like it, it, it's it's really really hard to come up with such things and and and, and program them the classical way. So with machine learning, it's it's like a total different thing. You just throw data at the problem and the, the neural net figures out how things work. And, and there are a lot, of, a lot of problems these days that, that are just like too hard to solve with traditional programming, like th things like self-driving cars, which are yeah, basically around the corner, or things like, like translations or, or, or face recognition, like or, 
all these things like 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 Facebook where they where they uh, group pictures together or on Google Photos these these things all use machine learning these days because it's it's much easier that way. So like the uh -huh. neural net is that actually written by you? So the neural net is um is, is there are a couple of frameworks that make it um, easier to um, to build these things. And the neural net, you, you can think of, of, of uh, like there are frameworks like uh, TensorFlow and um, Keras and, and, and a couple of others. And they give you basic building blocks like uh, layers. Um, and, and you, yeah, you design, you design the, the, the neural net and the neural net can have a different architecture uh, depending on the task that you are trying to solve. Um, yeah, but and, and 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 other than that, you are still writing a little bit of code because you you need to um, you need to put, bring the data in shape, for instance. Like a, a neural net just understands um, uh, basically um, uh, numbers, right? So basically, if you um, if you want to recognize a cat, um, you still have to um, convert the, the picture into actual um, numbers that a, a neural net can understand. So, there, so there's there's a little bit of, of of code, boilerplate code that you that you need to do with your data to bring it in shape and everything. But in essence, the, the hard task um, is um, performed by by the neural net. And you can think of you can think of the neural net in a way. I, I, I said it's it's kind of trying to mimic the the way our brain works. So um, we can think of it as having neurons, um, which are basically just numbers. Like there are a lot of and, and and when you when you start the the training at the very beginning, you can think of this neural net of just like being a bag of numbers that are totally random. And you you start with totally random numbers, and basically the 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 inputs are flowing through the the neural net, and those numbers in the neural net, which we call the weights, um, they are um, they are taken together with the input and going through an activation function. And the trick is that the neural net over time tunes all these weights, so, so all these numbers that in the beginning are just random, they will be tuned so that, um, yeah, at the end of the training, um, they are all, the, the, the numbers are, are tuned to actually solve the task. And it's pretty comparable in a way what, our brain is still very much more complex, but um, <laughs> um, it's, it's it's kind of a bit like like our brain works at least. It's also also the better hardware, our brain. Much better hardware, yeah, I guess. And you have so to how do, you have to do guided trainings as these things are learning, right? So you have to kind of guide it, say yes, this was actually a cat, or no, this wasn't a cat, and then eventually it kind of figures out, it kind of builds a dictionary of cats, and it's like, okay, well. You said it was a cat a hundred times, and this looks like those hundred times, so it's probably a cat. So, um, so there are there are there are two different two different um, uh, um, like like there is supervised training and unsupervised training. So there's also un, um, unsupervised training where you don't give feedback, and then the the neural net is trying to find patterns basically. Um, but um, yeah, where in, in, in this kind of training with the, with the cats, yeah, you, you, you give the feedback. But what happens internally is it's not really just like building up a map or something. Um, in, in fact, this can actually, in fact, this, 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 this may happen. And, and it, um, like what, what, what may happen is that it's, it, it just memorizes what it has seen. But that's not what we want, right? We, what we want is really that it generalizes and it can recognize all the other cat pictures out there that, that it did not see yet, right? Um, and if, if we have a neural nets that um, they, they, and we can think of them having, having layers, 
like layer of, of neurons um, stacked um, uh, behind each other, then what happens is that um, it kind of specializes in the layers and in, 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 in the um, and the, and the secondary uh, layers, like like the the first layer is is mostly concerned about straight lines and everything. Like like is there um, is there a, a, a straight um, horizontal line or vertical line or something? And then the 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 layer that go um, come after that, they they kind of build up on 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 these um, previous um, layer. It's, and, and this is again this is again. Um, Pretty much comparable to what our brain also does. So, as a developer stepping into something like this, how much different is it from our mindset of how we develop applications and writing code, you know, functional code or logical code that if this, then do that sort of thing versus what do we have to understand to write this is different? And yeah. is, it is it a hard requirement that we love cats? <laughs> I think so, definitely, yeah. <laughs> I think I think the main difference is um, in, in terms of programming. I mean, you still you still program. You still have to like write the code that creates this neural net or whatever you want to do. Um, but it it, it and but you, you have less like control structures because, as Crystal said, you you create this thing that figures out the the logic by itself. Um, you still write code though, but it's it's it has a different. Um, it's much more data driven after all, right? It's like not trying to like figure out how to solve this particular problem, but rather like, okay, how can I get my data in shape that I can create this thing that will consume that data to understand how this problem needs to be needs to be solved. Like, you know, when you think of self-driving cars, for example, it's the same thing. Like how does a self-driving car learn how to drive a car? And how does it learn the, 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 the rules of driving a car? Like things like stopping at a at a red traffic light or you know not going into the wrong lane or whatever you have to like an easy way to think about that would be to to you know create a neural net or whatever that that consumes a lot of video data of actually humans driving cars where you know it can see ah okay so apparently humans actually stop when the traffic light is red so that probably means that i have to stop when the traffic light is red um, so things like that uh, i think i think it's really much more Really much more um, like data scientific, scientific. Like you have to deal much more with the data itself and, and get it in shape. So I, I would add to that that um, so what's that? There's that's this thing that that you have to accept that this thing is kind of a black box, um, and there are certain implications of that. So so one thing is that. You often find yourself just um, a b testing different approaches, like um, will this neural net perform better if I add another layer or uh, increase the number of neurons? Um, you just try it out and 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 you can see if if it takes you less epochs um, so so the training always happens in epochs, right um, so you you can say, okay. Um, with this different setup, I just need 20 epochs um, to, to get to the desired result, uh, whereas with a different one, I, I need double the epochs or something. Um, so that's, that's often just how things work. And I mean, like, even with the real experts, like <laughs> for instance, there's, there's a really nice blog from NVIDIA, and NVIDIA is really at the forefront of, of machine learning, uh, where they, um, they teach a car to totally drive itself um, with um, an end-to-end -end approach. So there are different approaches to self-driving cars. And, 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 and I think most companies tackling, trying to tackle uh, self-driving cars don't do it completely end-to-end. -end. So they have different neural nets, um, um, one to recognize um, traffic lights and everything, and a different one to, to do lane assist or whatever. But in this NVIDIA blog post, they um, completely do it end to end. So what that means is they just have a camera mounted on, 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 the, on the front window of the car and um, they have an experienced driver doing um, some, some, some driving and they just record it. And they also get the, um, they get the values from um, the, the steering, the steering angle and the, um, the, the brake and acceleration. 
Um, and this is in sync with the video, obviously. Um, and they just feed that into the neural net. Um, and yeah, in essence, the, the, the car learns to drive itself just by looking at the video and, and the raw um, data. And they, they, they also, they, they A-B tested a, a different approaches. Um, and for instance, there are funny things, like they, they had to, um, to adjust the data a little bit because most of the time we drive um, straight uh, because roads try to be efficient, right? Um, but that you what you want to do is you you want to take a, you want to cut out a bit of the um, straight road driving because otherwise um, the the neural net performed didn't perform so well because it was kind of learning to always keep keep going straight. Um, so there's a lot of try and error. Now, uh, when you when you do um, machine learning, uh, it's 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 not so straightforward, maybe, and you have you have to accept that some things you just have to try out, uh, and also there's no there's no such thing as debugging really. I mean, um, it, they it's it's more called tuning. Um, so you are tuning the the data set and the approach and everything, but the thing is that if you look inside. In a, in a neural net, it's, it doesn't mean anything to a human. I mean, the, the, the good thing is that there are companies working on that, make, making that more um, transparent so that you actually get to know why the neural net is, is deciding this way or that way. Um, but this is really just, um, yeah, this is, this is pretty, pretty current science actually to improve on that field because right now you have to accept that this is really a black box, right? And, and you um, can't really debug it the same way you debug um, traditional code. So how did you two get into this, come up with this idea and get into it? Basically, hey. yeah, basically it's, it's, it's um, uh, yeah, I, I often get bored after quite some time with technology, especially with front end. <laughs> um, yeah, that, so, that makes sense. So you get bored, so you dive into like the hardest thing ever, right? I just don't get that. Like, I don't get that at all. Maybe it's because like you're smarter than me. Because like I've heard mm -hmm. other developers say that, where they're like, "Yeah, I got bored, so I moved on." And I'm like, I still haven't conquered the front end yet, I guess. But I don't know, man. <laughs> It's, it's really just, I don't know, I mean, you, you, uh, the, with machine learning, it's like you, you see it popping up everywhere, and then you, you start reading, and, um, and I found it fascinating that there's this thing that really just goes by itself and, and, and learns things. So, um, so I just wanted to, to, to get a little bit more into it, and then, yeah, I, I, I stumbled over a couple of problems. Um, yeah, this is pretty much um, how, how, how things went for, for, for me, at least, at that time. Um, so I was picking on Pascal, like, hey, um, you know what? I think we, <laughs> I think, I think we should build, build a tool there. And yeah, maybe, just... maybe, we should, maybe we should point out some, some things, that, like some, some of these problems. I think, um, because otherwise it might not be very clear. So, so yeah. one of the, the challenges that, that um, uh, one runs into, especially as average web developers like us um, that are not like, you know, in any way familiar with tools like, you know, Python and, and TensorFlow and things like that. These are usually the, the tools and environments that are used in this field um, mainly right now. Um, and so, so it, it kind of requires you to to get everything set up if you want to try these things out. Like if you want to play with TensorFlow and then Keras, which is you know this library that sits on top of TensorFlow or can sit on top of TensorFlow, um, you need to make sure that you have things like Python installed, that it's installed in the right version, that the libraries are installed in the right version because they might clash and then it doesn't work. And then, and then maybe it turns out that the easiest way to do that is to actually get Docker installed and then you have to, you know, Get Docker up and running, and then you know load all of these images and make everything work. And and so it's really the 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 barrier is 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 pretty high for for uh, like people like us, like that are not data scientists um, 
on a on a daily basis and that, that don't deal with environments and languages and tools like that. Um, th that's I think that's kind of the main kind of the main motivation why this idea came up to to make something like a JS fiddle or a code pen or plunker um, for machine learning, um, which essentially is what what machine labs tries to be. It's not exactly the same thing because there's some different characteristics in terms of executing code on the server instead of in the in the client. Um, but if you if you want to get an idea of what what the the problem is that machine labs tries to solve, I think the the, the shortest and easiest answer to that is really it's kind of like the Copan or Plunker for, for machine learning. I think that's the, the, the rough idea. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we as, as web developers, we, we, we kind of take it as granted that, that we can just go on Stack Overflow and, um, and say, um, I have this problem, and here's a JS fiddle or here's a Plunker or something, and can you help me with that? And this, the, the, the tooling for, for, for these kind of things is, is, is just or was just not there for machine learning. Um, so this is also one of one of the things that, that we wanted to address that 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 you can you have something like a code pan for machine learning where you, you can just see something, you can fork it, you can tune it, you can you can um, execute the code. Um, yeah. Uh, to also to help to accelerate all the development with machine learning to, to, to lower the barrier of entry for everyone. Yeah, I, think, I think that's actually actually like a pretty, pretty good and, and very strong point there um, because in, in case we get it right and in case machine labs works out, then you can, you can actually imagine a world where right now on things like um, Stack Overflow and, and GitHub issues, for example, people actually link to GitHub repositories to like demonstrate things like you know, go check out this repository, make it somehow work on your machine, and then run it, and then you see how it works, right? Um, which is not usually what you what you want to do. Like you know, you don't you don't want to go through this hassle of setting everything up. So, so if, if everything works out and and if, if we do it right, then you can actually imagine a world where all of these answers on Stack Overflow or or comments on GitHub. Um, with links to repositories can essentially be replaced with links to labs, which is what we call our fiddles or plunks, right? So you can basically say, here's a plunk that you know does this or that, and you can check out the code and and, and take a look. And uh, on on top of that, obviously this this allows you to 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 share these these labs also on on social platforms like like Twitter and Facebook and stuff. So all of or a sudden. Even Oh yeah, or you can embed it in, in in another website. Like we did exactly that. We we have like an embedded feature, and we have a couple of blocks in our in our ThoughtRam block. Um, and and some of these blocks are actually machine learning articles, which previously were just um, like like code snippets, and you kind of had to imagine how it works when you do it. And now we actually have embedded labs in there, and you can actually. Take a look at the code. You can see the output of the code when it was executed, and you can go on machine labs and run it yourself if you want to. Um, so I think I think that's really um, it's a good thing, and 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 it's it's also like a very strong strong feature of this whole project because yeah we we it's part of the mission as well to make this whole thing more accessible to everyone. Um, the more it gets shared, the more people can actually play with it and take a look at it, the more people can start diving into it. Obviously, there, there are much more things um, that, that need to be addressed to get it right. For example, right now, we have, um, we, we're in our private beta, so, so there are already some users in there um, that are like able to execute code, um, and we will probably see in a couple of minutes what that looks like when Chris have demos some stuff. Um, but then there's this problem of people then just don't know what they should do with it. Like they don't really know where to start. They don't know what to do. I mean, we have some like some some template code that you can easily fork and just execute, so you get something that you can play with right away, which is already pretty cool. Um, but then there's a lot of I think there's a lot of like guidance missing, tutorials and stuff like that that you can like easily you know 
do and, and do yourself on, on machine labs maybe um, to make this yeah a, a bit more accessible also. Okay, so, so you want, if, if you want just, just like a, a, a quick outlook in, into the future, then what, what we would like to enable people to do is like build like a, a self-driving car in your browser and other people can just come and fork it and tune it and everything. Like, like these kind of things we, we would like to see in, the, in, in future versions that, that people could do. OK, so it's this tool that I can go to that I can play with some examples, like you Plunker or Stack Blitz, something like that, right? I could create my own. Um, where does the, you mentioned data, right? Where does the data fall into this? Like, how do I, is this something that supports adding a data set? Do you have, like, is that part of the mix? How does that work? Yeah, so um, Brazilian cat pictures, right? If I if I need a ton of cat pictures. Right. So so the good thing is that there are tons of data sets out there for, yeah, pretty much any stuff, cat pictures as well, but also like self-driving car stuff and everything. There are like tons of, of, of video material and then everything, and um, so the way these 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 labs work um, is that. The, the the code obviously is, is, is around back end side, right? Because this is all, all back end tech. And you have you have full internet access. So you can um in, in, in your lab you you can just download the data set and work with that. Um in the future we also plan things like like um pre-downloading data sets. Um so there's a configuration file that 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 already exists today and um it's it's an uh, we call it ML YAML because it's it's a YAML file, um, and in, in in the future you will be able to just like put a couple of of endpoints in this um, YAML file, and then we will um, cache those data sets for you, uh, so you will have it downloaded directly when you when you run the execution. But even today you you, you can just access any data set because yeah you have full internet access yeah. If you want, uh, if you want me to to um, share my screen and, and 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 walk you through the UI a little bit, we we can do that. Yeah, let's check it out. Okay, cool. Let's do that. So, uh, boop, boop, boop. so, all right. So you should see the screen now. And so there we go. You can see it. Yep, looks good. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, that's, that's this is Python though, right? This isn't JavaScript. This is Python, yeah. So um, you can leave now, correct? Sorry, I just said right off, so you can leave now. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a very bad joke. We can we can cut it. Out. <laughs> yeah. So so the most most of the of the machine learning um, stuff is um, yes Python based um, these days. Um, I mean TensorFlow is is actually written in C plus plus. Um, but then there are Python. The, 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 most of the people use it in Python. There are bindings for different languages. Um, in essence, we are not really bound to a platform um, for to to a specific ecosystem. So, in fact, there just recently there there was this this, this library, um, uh, Deep Learn. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Deep. How's it called? Is it Deep Learn? Um, it's it's a JavaScript. Um, uh, JavaScript framework that that um, uh, is also for for deep learning, and we will probably add support for that as well. So it's 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 not really that we are bound to to Python. Um, it's just that this is what what most people use um, to yeah do actual work, because it also has pretty pretty good um, library support. There are like for all these mathematical operations and all this, it's, it's pretty good. Okay, so um, yeah, this is this is what the what the UI looks like. So we have a, a, um, a file tree here. Um, we could just um, add um, add more files and everything. This is, by the way, this is the um, the ML YAML that I just talked about. So this is basically a configuration file. So for instance, if you if you want to work with a different a different library or you don't want to use Python three, you want to use Python two or something. Then you can just um, change the um, Docker um, image ID in, in, in this uh, in this file, and then you will your code will run in a completely different environment. Um, this also enables us enables us to support uh, yeah a, a wide range of, of, of different machine learning um, machine learning platforms. Um, 
All right, so yeah, then we obviously we have we have the code window here, and we have a, a, a list of executions. So we, we can see that here already there was an execution that was executed seven days ago, um, ran for three seconds, and there is um, um, actually uh, this one. I, I just picked a random one, so let's just um, actually execute this one, and we will see real real output. So here now we can see this was a really a really quick one actually, but basically what just happened here is um, that we um, we started this, this this execution and then this is where the training happens. So you can see epoch one, epoch two, epoch three, and so on and so forth. And what we what we see here is yeah is, is the um, the the training results after after each epoch. So as I said in the beginning, this, this machine learning is about um, yeah uh, learning things over over these these epochs and, and tuning the the internal weights. So we can see that this is um, how how accurate we were in the beginning. So uh, we we were doing so twenty five percent of of our um, predictions were were off, and then you can see that these these are rising, and at some point here, we get a 100% accuracy. Um, yeah, so this is this is basically um, just yeah giving us the the, the output of um, of that uh, training task. So this here is the absolute toy task. Um, it is. Uh, the, the hello of the hello world in machine learning. Um, so uh, it's, it, this is this is learning the XOR gate. So uh, you can, but it, it's good to get the idea. So here you see we have we have training data, um, and we what we basically want to learn is that um, okay, if you have two similar ones, so a zero zero, then this should be um, a zero. If you have or, or one one, also two similar, it should also be zero. And if, if the two are different, so one zero or zero one. We should we should get a one. So this is the it's it's the XOR gate. Um, it's something that you can easily put in the map. So <laughs> you you don't really want to use machine learning for for that kind of task. But yeah, just as a demonstration thing, um, it's it's the easy thing to um, to get if you if you've never seen machine learning code before. And then this part here is setting up our neural net um, with our layers. And then we are um, configuring a little bit more, like how do we, um, how, how the internals should should work. And, and, and last but not least, we, we we kick off the training and say how, how many epochs you want to run. And yeah, this is then um, this is then going to our backend. And what I will do now here is just um, or maybe we can we can switch to a different one with that has slightly slightly better. Um, I have a quick question on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, once we've taught this digital brain how to do it, it's got effective. Like, how does that commit it to long-term memory? Where does that go? So that, like, what's the final output of this? Yeah, that's a really good, good really good question. So, um, right now, what what you have really is just, um, oops, um, it's, it's really just you 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 have the um, you have the code here and you get your console output. But obviously, you want to persist. The, the trained the trained model right the, so the, the the trained model is what has all the yeah all the game knowledge actually and what we are working on and we're actually pretty close on releasing it um, is that you can store these um, outputs so basically what we will allow you is that in an execution you can just write any file it could be the trained model but it could also be pictures or whatever you can just write any file to disk and we take it and upload it, and we'll um, yeah you, you will see it then in the UI that it, it's associated to to this execution. And what's even more um, what's what's even more exciting is that um, you can, for instance, you can have a you, you can do a training that may run for several days. So let's say you have a training; it goes for five days, and it builds up this 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 model that then has all the knowledge. And what other people can do is they can not only fork it and tune it, but they can also um, do a different lab and just import the trained model from that other lab and then use this and, and do things on top so they don't have to invest five days of training again. 
Chris, um, very quickly. Um, you actually, I can see myself right now. That should give you a hint. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So maybe I'll just switch over here again. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah. So that's. I think that's 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 pretty exciting. Um, so there will be a lot of a lot of use cases for that. Um, so not only that you want to write the the the, the model or something. Also, let's for instance, if if you want to do something like you want to do a Prisma, you uh, the, the the Prisma app, you know that that takes a picture and then it applies a, a nice um, style on it so that it looks like a Van Gogh or something. Um, you can you will soon be able to do these things with machine labs in the browser and and you can directly write the output like like the the, the picture that that was transferred to look like a, like a Michelangelo or something and you can directly write that into the execution and you could share it. you can share it on Twitter you can you can, people can see okay this there's that's all the code that it needs to, to build a prisma and okay, I can I can just apply this to my own picture, and I can see the output picture here. It's it's right there in the lab. So yeah, this is this is a feature that we are pretty excited about, and it, it, it's coming pretty soon. Nice. Um, so so by the way, this this one here is a is, is a is a different um, a different lab, and um, it this is um, it's it's. It's really just a demo lab, also from from the cast and um, documentation. Um, this is a handwriting recognition. Um, but if I run this thing here, then the output will at least be a little bit more um, more real, uh, real world, more realistic. And you can see this sometimes takes a takes a little bit of time to um, until it starts, but you can see it. Right at right from the moment where you start the execution, you will see it popping up in the in, in, in the ex execution list here. But then we yeah on the backend side we have to spin up the the container and everything. So yeah, here you can see now this is more like a real world task that that um, uh, learns how to do uh, uh, handwriting and recognition. So right now all you can see here basically really just is um, yeah okay the, the the training phase. So you can see that it's. It's trying to 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 get the loss down, the the, the error rate down, um, and yeah. But but in the future, you'll you'll be able to really to yeah um, save the, the the trained model and then then work with that. So the the idea would also be that you can just go to a plotter, for instance, and then you can um, you can request the trained model via a, a REST API from machine labs. And build a plunker that actually uses the trained model from machine labs via REST API, and then build something on top of that. Maybe maybe one thing to add here was what's really cool. Um, as you see this lab running right here, th this obviously is executed somewhere else, and and it's it's very. I mean, it's it's not. It's actually very common that that um, these experiments that they that they run for several like hours or even days, maybe even weeks. Right, so you you like do your thing, you let it run, and then you wait until it's done, and then you see if it's if it's performing good or not. And Days? That's insane. Yeah, it, it can happen. Yeah. Um, so so it, that's actually why you want to make sure that a your your code like or you, your hardware is super powerful, so that you reduce the time you have to wait. Because as Crystal said, it's it's hard to debug and everything. So you really just wait until it's done, and then you see the you see the results, and then you have to try. Okay. You have to see, okay, so those are the re results right now with this setup. What if right. I try this optimizer function instead of that one? And then you have to run it again. So it's a lot of trial and error. You do it over and over again until you find the best setup to get the best, the best output. And what right. you can do right now, actually, you can close that tab, and you can like revisit this particular um, lab, and it will just pick up right where you, where you left off because it's, it's obviously it's still running in the background now. You don't have to sit there and wait you can just jump into it right now and and you know watch the the live stream as it as it continues, which I think is, is a pretty cool thing because that essentially enables you to say something like, okay, uh, hey Twitter, look, this is this is a lab in which you can live like you can you can watch this this net learn you know whatever um, to to speak English or something. Like that. Right. So now it finished after three minutes of training, but yeah, right now the the output here is all we got. Um, 
Pascal, you just raised a, a pretty important point, which, which is the, 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 the hardware. And this is another thing that we want to enable is that, that people get access to, to blazingly fast hardware. Because not everyone has the hardware at home to do efficient um, machine learning. I mean, right now, this is all just using CPU. Um, but we will we will also soon soon add the um, uh, the the possibility to to decide on which hardware you want to launch your your experiments and and then you get access to hardware that you don't have at home. Yeah, I was actually going to ask like this stuff is not you know cheap to run like you have to have you know good hardware to run this stuff. So you know how are you guys how are you guys paying for this? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, you, you can totally you can totally do things with CPU, but uh, it, it obviously takes takes longer. Um, and if you want to use a GPU, then um, there there will be paid plans for these features. So our our plan is that um, basically everyone, uh, every user will will get free CPU hours um, every month. So um, there, there will always be a free plan um, where you can where you can burn a CPU hours, and we, we, we are not decided yet on how many hours that will be, but probably somewhere in the ballpark of like seventy five CPU hours um, every month for free. Um, but if you want to get access to these kind of um, more advanced things, which also means you are probably doing something more serious, like you're using it for your job or something. Um, then you you will um, you will have to um, get a, a, a paid plan, and you will also um, pay for these um, these extra hardware. Hey, so let's talk a little Angular since we're Angular Air. Uh, is built in Angular? I, I see. It right. is. It is using Angular and Angular Material and Oops. Angular Flex layout. I, I'm just going to to. Quit the screen share, right? Um, yeah, that worked out. We can see you again. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, so machine labs uses um, Angular, obviously, which which is, which is, um, I think for both, but for me personally, um, a lot. It, it's very exciting because um, we, we're doing mainly uh, like Angular training, and since a couple of years now. And now we, we finally got a chance to actually use the tool we're teaching like on a daily basis and, and build something and, and, and use these things that we teach. Uh, so and, and this what you see there, or what you've just seen is is the result of um, like a couple months of work, um, part-time work though, um, from just two people. So I think that's that's pretty cool to get there. And, and this is only possible because we have things like Angular Material, for example, is contributes a lot to, to the to the project because you, you you've probably noticed that there's things like the uh, angular material toolbar and then there's the, the the site nav that you know slides in and slides out and then there's some nice tabs that you can click and um, we actually we have like plenty 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 dialogues in there and dialogues are actually really hard to do but with angular material it's like a matter of a couple lines of code and, and I really I really appreciate that that we have this this ecosystem already there, and and we just get it for free. Um, so yeah, that, that's 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 pretty cool. And and it's also the project itself is is getting pretty pretty com complex already. Also in, in in terms of architecture, I mean, you don't see it when you use it, obviously. But there's there's a lot of a lot of reactive programming going on. There's there's a lot of like pretty much all of our APIs are observable. Base and and so we get to use a lot of interesting and exciting operators and sometimes we have to build our own to fulfill the needs. Um, so that that's pretty pretty exciting. Um, but it also comes with a lot of interesting challenges that are sometimes not hard to crack, uh, are actually hard to crack. So the other way around. So what are some of the things that you did in Angular, like beyond just the normal stuff that we do in Angular, right, to build these applications? Like anything that you hit, you know, you've got, you're showing the console output from these other machines that are running. Like what, what interesting things that you had to solve using Angular to do this? Yeah, I think, I think it already starts with something like, like what you mentioned, like the, the console output, for example, like both the, the, the version that you've just seen, the console output and the, the actual code editor, 
those are actually um, ACE editor instances. So there's this open source project called ACE editor, which is, um, I think, created by Cloud9 is the company. They have this online ID thing. Um, and it's open source, so we used that. That was the first thing we ran into. And, uh, and it, it worked quite well. Um, but this is, like, for example, one thing that is maybe something you don't usually do, which is you know um, integrating third-party libraries into an existing framework, making it work, um, also when it comes to things like performance and stuff. Um, uh, I mean, there are surely people who did that already. For me, it was, it was a, at least for me personally, it was, it was a nice challenge to, to make that work. And it was not really hard to do um, because of how Angular works, which is pretty cool. Um, but then Did you have to do a lot of uh, running outside of Angular when you use oh, that? Oh, no, not at all. That's, that's the whole thing. Like, you actually don't need to do that. Um, because Angular has this whole zone thing, that's actually the thing that enables you to, to use things without doing a lot of extra work. Uh, so, 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 yeah. And I think, um, other than that, uh, what, was, what was pretty challenging also for me was, um, uh, and I think Christoph can, uh, in a few seconds, add a lot of things about observable APIs, but Another thing that was for me personally pretty challenging was uh, we have this so we have this editor view that you've just seen with like you know the console and the editor and then the site nav and, and stuff like that and then the toolbar, but then there's this other um, like view which is the embedded editor. That's basically the view that you get when you want to embed a lab, um, which you can easily do. Um, but an embedded editor is also just an editor that executes code and that has like a console and the, the editor view where you can actually see the code. So it is pretty much the same thing as what we already have, just that when you have an embedded editor, there, there are some things that you might not want, right? Like, for example, you don't necessarily want to see the execution list on, on the right-hand side. You don't necessarily want to allow people to actually run things from an embedded editor. Maybe you just want to, you want them to like replay existing executions and stuff like that. So there, there's a lot of functionality um, that is common between these two use cases, like a full editor view and an embedded editor view. Um, and then there's also like the whole styling thing and making things a bit smaller and, and but you know trying to reuse as many things as possible. That that was that was a, a fun thing to do because um, uh, that that is one of the the architectural changes that we did to where we actually took advantage of. Um, the ng module APIs, which which are, which can be weird, right? You have like an ng module and you have another ng module, and one shares the other, and then you import here and there, and then you have a shared module, and all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, I have this module which actually needs to import something from there, which is already imported here, and it has its own providers, and that you know the whole rabbit hole. Um, and so, I think we we made it work quite nicely in the end, but it was. It was interesting to run into these things um, because sometimes you see them popping up here and there when people ask about it, but never actually experiencing it um, yourself. It's, it makes a difference when you actually run into it yourself and, and you know try to come up with a solution. Um, okay, I think I talked enough now. Chris. Yeah, and I bet you could figure out like like in that problem you're talking about in terms of the editor and the embedded editor, like did you discover an architecture pattern that said, oh, okay, I'm going to take the pieces of the editor and have them as components and then have like a parent component for the the inline editor and the parent component for the site it's, and then those just it, it scaffold is, it together? Just yeah, different it's mainly, um, we have like basically the, the idea is we have one like ng module, which is an ng, uh, an editor module. And that comes with all the building blocks to create an editor view. So it has things like an editor service to run code. There's all the logic in you can, uh, there's all the logic inside. You can just use that to run the code, so you don't have to re-implement it over and over again. Um, there's the 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 ace editor component is in there. There's the console output is in there. Um, the toolbar is in there, and, and or or at least parts of the toolbar. So you can build different versions of it, which is what, what was needed. So it's basically like a like a box of building blocks, and you just take what you need and build your own editor view. Now we can build as many different ones as we want now that we have it set up that way. Nice. All these things that you learn, right, as you dive into it and start building apps, you're like, oh, OK, 
cool, I yeah. got to solve this problem. And then what comes out of it is like these new patterns that you're like, oh, cool, now I understand what I got to tackle that. And like you said, and you're training later, now you have this even more concrete answer to really deliver. And exactly. Yeah. Is there any plans for like some type of visualization of, of what's going on or what happened? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it's also one of these things that we want to enable that, that um, yeah, you, you, you can get a better idea of like what's happening in the neural net, uh, what is the neural net like thinking about those cats. <laughs> um, and um, there are a couple of visualizations um, that, that, that people use when, when they use these frameworks and, and we want to enable them to, to, to work with them right from within the browser. It's it's just there's so much thing right now on our plate, um, but it, it's it's definitely coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to add to to what 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 Pascal said that yeah I think the 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 the, the, the main challenges in, in this project is really this this whole reactive nature of things. So um, it's like I mean it's 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 all observables from from top to to bottom right because um you are um you're starting these streams on the server side and then you have this output and this output we we support infinite output so you can just like if if you have a training and it goes for thirty days then it goes for thirty days and you can infinitely um, watch the output um so um and obviously you, you you can have like multiple executions running in parallel and then you can go back and forth between those and so this is all yeah very very much observable driven um so there are yeah lots of challenges um but but this is this is i would say is, is like the probably the, the the toughest part of of the project so in terms of angular as, as pascal said there was Nothing where we actually had to to work around it. Um, I think we had a couple of struggles with the UI here and there, um, but yeah, we are. I, I mean, the the the, the we, we are using um, uh, material UI, so this this takes a lot of the pain away already. Very nice, very nice. Well, we're getting to the top of the hour, so I guess we better wrap things up. Um, why don't you tell us really quick what, uh, so you, it's private beta now? We can sign up, people can go there and go to the site and sign up for that? Right, so private, so private beta right now means basically when we when you try to execute code, you you will hit a, a dialog that tells you, oh, you are now on the waiting list. Um, or you actually, you, you now have to log in and then you're on the waiting list and then you just have to wait. We are, we are activating people in batches, so the, 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 the more trust we gain in the whole platform, the more people we onboard. So right now we have about like 70, 75 people in the, in, in, in the private beta. Um, and um, yeah, we, you just have to wait a little and then you will be paid. But it's, it's a nice Angular material dialogue. Right. That's jumping right into your face. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, so uh, what are, do you want to announce some of the other features that you're working on um, as well that, that are in the pipeline? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Do you want to go ahead? Otherwise, I mean, I think go I have ahead. one, and I think you have one too. I mean, okay. So the, the feature that I'm working on right now is mainly um, we, um, we we are working on a cool integration, which is we actually try to um, uh, make like runnable apps available for the uh, Keras API um, or the, the the documentation. So we're working on that with them, and uh, while we were doing that, um, we basically ran into this thing that. Um, our output is not working entirely correct. Like uh, you've probably seen all the er arrows, like you know, um, being appended to the output when Chris have executed the lab. That's, for example, actually something that should update in place. Like when you run this code on your local machine, like the way a terminal works, you have a progress bar and updates in place. So that's something that that doesn't work right now very well um, in in our current production version. So that's something something we need to fix and and and. That's um, that one feature that, that I'm personally working on right now, um, where we have a proper uh, like terminal emulation, so that the output that you get is what you would actually get when you run this on your local machine. And this will come soon, actually. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, then the, the, the other big feature is yeah, what I, what I just um, mentioned uh, about these um, uploads. So you'll, you'll be able to just store any file to slash uploads and uh, we just take it, um, upload it, and, and people will see it in the UI um, that is just yeah, sitting there and, and will be available then via REST API for others to use. Um, we're also working on adding more providers. So right now you can only log in with uh, GitHub but you'll soon soon be able to to log in with with different providers like like Google. Um, yeah, these these are the, the the main features that we currently have in the pipe. Nice, nice. And what's the site that they can go to? People can go to sign up. Just machinelabs.ai. And as soon as people log in, they are on the waiting list. Nice, nice. All right. Well, thanks a lot for uh, sharing the stuff with us, talking this topic and and uh, demoing this stuff. It's pretty awesome. Let's get into picks real quick, and then we'll wrap up. I have so one quick question. Got yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Is the code for the UI um, open source? Are there people able to go in and play with that? Unfortunately, not. We just actually moved everything into a Mono repository, so that means everything is in there. Also, the server side stuff, and it's 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 private. No problem. We're just curious. It, it's actually something that we considered, and, and, and this is this was why we had it in separate repositories in the first place because we considered that the UI may be open source at some point, but we we, we wanted to go with the mono repo repository. So for for now at least, it, it won't be open source. But we 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 may reconsider that in the future. But for now, it will stay closed. All right, Mike. Since you're on the mic, Mike, you get to do picks first. All right, I've got two picks. Uh, first one is there's a lot of uh, conversation recently about UX um, and doing different things from your with your UI. Uh, but in terms of UX, there's a good article about web audio and form validation by Ruth John. Uh, link will be in the show notes to uh, consider the idea of using audio as part of your form validation to kind of give a different aspect and different um, experience to your users. So definitely an interesting read. Whether or not you do it or not is uh, up to you, but just something interesting to consider. Also, the my other pick is an article posted by Patrick Stapleton uh, that is entitled Patent-Free React Ecosystem Migration Plan. With all, everything that's going on and conversations about the licenses, or licenses around the React framework, um, and then potentially as well with uh, Preact and Vue, uh, definitely an interesting read to consider and make sure that you consider the license of the frameworks that you're using to determine who's going to own your code and what you can do with the code that you're using. All right. All right, Alyssa? Um, so I have a project by Wasim, and I'm really bad with his last name. Is it Chegam? It's C-H-E-G-H-A-M. Anyways, Wasim has a project. Um, you can go and check it out for yourself that he's starting at angular.run. Um, and he's calling it Klingon, and I, apparently it's thanks to Mike for Klingon. I don't know like if you just inspired him with a Star Wars reference there, but anyway, so basically Klingon is this project. Wrong universe, wrong universe. Oh, wrong universe, oh my gosh. <laughs> hey, Star Trek. hey, long day. <laughs> so, okay, sorry. So basically it's a UI on top of the Angular CLI, and it's supposed to be a project that are for people who are basically allergic to the command line. Um, and so <laughs> um, he is super, super busy with another project right now. And so if anybody wants to help him with that one, go ahead and reach out to him. But yeah, check it out at angular.run. And uh, that's for my pick today. Nice, nice. All right, Austin, what do you got, Austin? Nothing this week. All right. Fair enough. You always have like 72 picks, so you you got plenty of credits. It's, it's hit or miss. It's hit or miss, <laughs> but I have something. Awesome. All right, Bonnie? OK, so I have two picks, and I'm actually a super nerd because I'm super excited. Uh, and I'm not saying this because Pascal and Christoph were here, because I was going to say this anyway. But uh, I just finished Angular Masterclass here in Houston, and it was so, so you, like I can't even tell you guys how excited I am. Um, about Redux and NGRX, and it was just, there's like so much stuff 
that is crammed in my brain. Uh, they worked us really hard. Thomas and uh, Thomas Burles and, and Dominic Elm were down here. Uh, they worked us so hard. So my pick would be the Angular Masterclass in Berlin, which is coming up in two weeks. Uh, so I'll give you a link for that. And then my other pick actually was is, is a person because uh, Dominic Elm came from Germany to do uh, the masterclass. And he like I, I met him before, but I never paid attention. And he's the greatest. He's so interesting and uh, super, super wicked smart, very charming. And his enthusiasm is endearing. Uh, and just so there's a link, I'm going to I'm going to send you guys a link to uh, the article that he just wrote, the Redux snake article. And it has this don't, don't be like me and click on the game because you'll never finish reading the article. The article is actually really interesting, but the game is addictive. It's like this little what is it like an old Atari thing? And the snake goes around and you got to let it's anyway, read yeah, the article okay, first. before. Snake. Yeah, you have to read the article first before you click on the game. Otherwise, you, you like your break time. It, yeah. It's, it, it sucks you in, you can't stop playing. But anyway, um, Dominic is a hoot, and he's also really, really smart, and he's a um, cool guy, and I wish that I had spent more time talking to him last time I met him. Um, but but yeah, so uh, Angular Masterclass in Berlin coming up in a couple weeks, and go follow Dominic Elm because he's a hoot. Those are my picks. Nice. That It's interesting that you bring up the snake game uh, because I think there was a machine learning something that was tweeted out a while back ago about beating snake and somebody put that through some machine learning and actually had a video of, of uh, the snake game being actually won. So that should be my, my pick. <laughs> I would love to see that old, uh, you guys remember the old um, uh, battleship game from the eighties? You sank my battleship. I would love to see that in machine learning. That's a good idea. That'd be cool. Yeah. All right. My yeah, pick, but yeah. My, my pick is uh, there's an import cost plugin for WebStorm. Uh, people know kind of my love for WebStorm. And it, there's a similar uh, extension for VS Code, but basically uh, shows you your import statement cost in line in the editor. Um, so that's my pick. Uh, Pascal, Christoph, you guys got anything for us at the end here? Not much, actually, but I, 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 from, from the top of my head, what I just got to know today is a new translator that is also using machine learning behind the scenes, but it's much, much better than Google Translate or anything I've seen so far, and it's called uh, deepl.com, I think, and you should definitely check it out. deepl.com. Nice. Yeah, my, my pick is, uh, um, since we were talking about machine learning and stuff like that here, and maybe some people want to dive into that, um, there was a talk about this, like an introductory talk about machine learning and how neural nets work and like the basic idea, um, very nicely explained by Carmen uh, at Angular Connect. So it was actually an Angular talk um, without a lot of Angular, but at an Angular conference. So you might want to go to uh, YouTube and search for Angular Connect and Carmen or, or, or machine learning, stuff like that. Um, it's a very, very nice talk with a lot of nice slides that explain things very nicely. That's my pick. Cool. All right. Well, Pascal, Christoph, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate you, you two sharing your time with us and uh, talking to us about the stuff. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. All right. That's a wrap. We'll bye see bye. everybody next week. See Later. You.